Hello, I'm Colleen Holder and this is Let's Talk Tobago. Today we're coming to you from the Botanical Gardens in Scarborough, one of Tobago's most sought after event venues, primarily because of its serenity, but also because of its rich history. The gardens are just about 17 acres of land, which is bound to the north by the Claude Noel Highway and nestled in the heart of Scarborough. It's also the place where 33 species of birds and 15% of Tobago's bird species reside. We'll tell you more and explore the grounds as the program continues. But first, here's what's happening in our stories this week. A secretariat dedicated to Tobago's fight for internal self-government. Do you have land but no money to build? There's a program to help you with that. And Roxborough gets a mini weather station. This is Let's Talk Tobago. Welcome back to the Scarborough Botanical Gardens. This place was originally a sugar plantation owned by the Scobie family. That meant that the garden was primarily made up of, well, the obvious sugar cane and other plants and fruit trees such as bananas, plantains and mangoes. But that isn't so anymore. The estate was acquired by the then government from the Deal Fair estate for the establishment of a botanic garden in 1899. Hence the reason there are still quite a few mango trees left here. That's a bit of history right there. But here's something you might be aware of. The former Prime Minister and President, Arthur N. R. Robinson, has been credited with the creation of the International Criminal Court. And though his political work extended beyond this country, it never dimmed his passion for Tobago and the need for internal self-government. In fact, he advocated the resurrection of the then-defunct Tobago House of Assembly. And today, as this island mourns his passing, there's a school of thought that giving Tobago a greater say in the running of its own affairs is the greatest tribute which can be given to Mr. Robinson. More from Omadara Mills, who attended the third meeting of political leaders, where this issue is the main item on the agenda. With hundreds of suggestions coming in about the best way to honor the late Arthur N. R. Robinson, two of the three political parties in Tobago are saying that granting the island greater autonomy is something Mr. Robinson would have wanted. It is well known that Mr. Robinson has fought hard and long and persuasively for the establishment of the Tobago House of Assembly, and no greater tribute can be paid to the man um, than to, the, um, uh, to ensuring that the people of Tobago do in fact get their full autonomy. And the leader of the Tobago platform of truth, Ho Choi Charles, agrees. I think that the greatest tribute that the country, the government, the parliament, and the people can pay to Mr. Robinson at this time is to make sure that they give his people the freedom that he has started, the struggle which he has started to give us our freedom, give us our internal, our self-government, so that the people can get on with their life. But the political parties are not just talking about the issue. At their third meeting, they announced that the secretariat, headed by the former chief administrator, Alan Richards, has been established. The secretariat will have a draft schedule of meetings with stakeholders, and the secretariat has been mandated that these meetings must be completed by June the 30th. There will be a minimum of 10 meetings, but all of these meetings must be held um, before the 30th of June. The Secretariat will also have to draft a protocol plan for the inter-party relations and present a plan for the spread of information to the public at the next meeting carded for May 13th. It's hoped that in addition to the meetings and the conferences in the coming months, a bill will be debated in the Parliament by the end of September of this year. I'm Umar Mills for Let's Talk to Begu. Tourism drives our economy, but since the global financial crisis in 2008, this sector took a big hit. It's now on the road to recovery. Last year alone, our market experienced a 4% increase. Compare that to the growth seen by the rest of the Caribbean, which was in the vicinity of just over 2%. There are also discussions aimed at increasing the number of high-end rooms on the island, just one of the initiatives which should ensure this destination remains a preferred choice for tourists. And as Davia Chambers explains, this plan seems to be working. 
The 2014 winter season on this island runs from November to April, and things are definitely looking up for the sector. For January and February alone, the island saw an increase in the amount of international visitors, an increase of 19% when compared to the same time last year. That's due mainly to the Apollo flight, the fact that Monarch has done better. We've had a much fuller Monarch flight. Uh, Condor's done well. This boosted a lot of sales for tourism-oriented businesses. Yes, I think it was really a good idea with the new flights, and it really did some good with us. While there was an increase in the international arrivals, tourism officials are looking forward to boosting the number of local visitors as well. This month, for instance, is about 55% um, occupancy. Um, but what we've got for the Easter, the period kind of 18th to the 21st of April, uh, we've got a lot of properties uh, are getting full. We still have availability in all categories. Um, for Jazz, the, the 25th to 27th period, uh, we're pretty much full. We do have some smaller properties that have, have availability. And if anybody needs rooms, uh, the best thing to do is to phone the hotel association. Mr. James says this year the winter season has been extended to the end of April because of the Tobago Jazz experience. But as summer rolls in, this is the expectation. Apollo came to the end of its 16-week cycle. So we, we now have to kind of invigorate Trinidadians to come back over, make sure that we get Monarch full with additional marketing throughout the summer. The Division of Tourism and Transportation is hoping to expand its market to South America as well. I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago. We all want our own home. For most of us, we've worked out exactly what it looks like, even the color. But the reality is there are thousands who find it almost impossible to acquire a house. But then there are those with what some might call mixed blessings. They have land, but no money to begin construction. Well, there's good news for these landowners. You may have a plot of land which you acquired legally in a residential area but you are unable to build or complete the construction of your house because of the cost. Well, there's an initiative called the Beneficiary Owned Land Program. We're improving the existing housing stock and we're increasing the housing stock on one end. But we realized still that there was a gap in terms of there are people who have land but just need assistance to build on their land, you know. So they don't want a grant because they don't have the house and they don't want a house because they have the land that they want to build on. The basic construction of a three-bedroom house on a relatively flat piece of land can cost between $600,000 to $800,000, a figure beyond the reach of many. But that's where the division steps in. We need to also prove your income because based on your income, then we will be able to um, let you know how much money we can assist you with. So if your income is at a higher level, you'll get a lower subsidy of $35,000. If your income is at the lower level, then you'll get a higher subsidy of $50,000. To qualify for the subsidy, prospective homeowners need to show legal ownership of the land. They must also have approval from town and country for the structure they want to build. With the distribution of houses, grants and subsidies, this beneficiary-owned land program is just another initiative by the Division of Settlements and Labor designed to ensure all Tobagonians can have something to call their own. I'm Umdara Mills for Let's Talk Tobago. It's time to take a break, but coming up, Art meets Jazz at Tobago Fashion Coda. You're viewing Let's Talk to Bigel. Thanks for staying with us at the Scarborough Botanical Gardens. The garden was mapped out and the paths laid by experts from the Royal Botanic Gardens in Britain. It's arguably some of the best work since the Royal Botanic Gardens, which is also known as Kew Gardens and is synonymous with exquisite greenery and picturesque landscapes. Here there are a few mahogany trees planted on this side of the garden and we're told that at least two of them were planted by the late Arthur N. R. Robinson during his tenure as Prime Minister. And last but not least, there's the gazebo, often used as a prop for wedding ceremonies, 
Christmas parties, concerts, you name it, it happens right here. But now you're probably aware there's a new meteorological station being built in the Crown Point area. That's expected to be the nucleus for weather information on this island. But it's also just one aspect to the operations. In communities across Tobago, there are several weather stations to record precise information about that specific location. Let's find out more. If you're in the east of the island, in Roxborough to be specific, and notice this instrument, you might be wondering what it is. Well, this is what's known as a hot log weather station. Put simply, it's used to measure weather patterns. It records the temperature, humidity, rainfall, dew point, and even solar radiation which occurs in this area. This instrument will record precise information for this particular area as it relates to Roxborough because the information that you would get for Crown Point would not be representative for the entire island. So it's important to have data for actual specific locations. Many weather stations like this one in Roxborough will be set up and monitored in other areas such as Scarborough, Mount Dillon, the Forest Reserve and Goodwood. A project which Mr. Robin says will give a better sense of the weather and climate changes on the island. That would give us better information as to how the different areas are, are behaving in relation to climate because every area have a specific microclimate that we want to examine in the context of climate change and what is happening. This station which operates using solar energy records data all day for up to 30 days. It will be monitored by the THA's Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. I'm Omodara Mills for Let's Talk Tobago. Police youth clubs have been around for decades. Their presence in communities around the country and in this island in particular provides our young people with an alternative to liming on the block and getting into trouble. For years, they've been a place of nurture and now Tobagonians have another opportunity to take advantage of this initiative. Davia Chambers tells us why. These young people are growing up in a positive light. They're a part of a group that steers them away from negative activities and directs them in the right path. They're members of the Signal Hill Police Youth Club, the 10th of its kind in Tobago. Police youth clubs were established in 1974, guided by four fundamental tenets. First being spiritual development, sporting and cultural activities, social and community work, and academia. To ensure youths are directed to meaningful activities away from a life of idleness. And as you can see, it's an investment in developing talent as well. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. But it's more than this. It's also a way for the Trinidad and the Tobago Police Service to achieve one of its more important goals to reduce crime. Through positive and ongoing interactions and activities, inclusive of counseling, mediation, remedial classroom homework, and the development of the cultural arts and sports, police youth clubs have been able to encourage and steer youths away from a life of crime. The Signal Hill Police Youth Club has been operating since July 2013. The members were also rewarded for their dedication. I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago. Tobago may no longer be regarded as the breadbasket of our country, but there are farmers who've worked the land for decades to provide for their communities and this island. Let's meet the members of the Bell Garden Farming District who did just that. Many of them stuck with agriculture in a time when large machines were non-existent and they had to master the science of planting and reaping without the help of apps and today's technology. For their dedication and commitment, they're being honored. Kathura St. John is being honored for her dedication to farming. She has racked up close to 70 years in the field, including the time she spent around agriculture as a little girl. 
the dedication to a profession many have turned their backs on is the reason the Bell Garden Farming District is honoring her and others like Samuel Sylvester, another farmer who has given close to 60 years to the land. He, like many here, started farming as a means of survival and to support for their families. And they did it all manually, no help from fancy machinery and today's technology. For many of you who are small farmers, part-time farmers, but in crop or livestock, we would have seen the efforts that you would have given over the years, the productivity that would have come from your own hands, the work that you would have accomplished, the produce that you would have sold, and the appreciation that you would have gotten from many who would have seen what you would have done. The awards ceremony not only recognizes the contributions made by persons farming for many years, it's also encouragement to younger persons such as IFA MAP. Altogether, the awards ceremony honored 10 farmers in the areas of animal husbandry, crop cultivation and mixed farming, all appreciated for their ability to share their knowledge with others. You would have left a legacy behind that is important. A legacy where you would have been able to influence others who are now in the, the sector today, who are now in farming today. And it is important to know that you have encouraged and we recognize and thank you for the fact that you would have also encouraged many along the way. Public recognition like this is encouraged by the Division of Agriculture, Marine Affairs, Marketing and the Environment, which continues to invest in agriculture on this island in order to make Tobago self-sufficient. I'm Omidara Mills for Let's Talk Tobago. We're taking another break, but do stay with us for highlights from a dance festival held on this island. It's picture perfect with over 100 reasons to come. The intensely nurturing sensation of being so close to nature. The laid back rhythm of the island. And of course the outstanding Tobago Jazz Experience. 2014 brings to its main stage Keisha Cole, Grammy Award winners, Earth, Wind and Fire, Brandy, and the man himself, John Legend. Everything on one incredibly perfect island. The Tobago Jazz Experience 2014, April 19th to 27th. Much more than music. Welcome back. You're viewing Let's Talk Tobago coming to you from the Scarborough Botanical Gardens. Right now we're exploring more of this magnificent space. Now it's host to many native and non-native flora. In fact, some of these plants, like the silk cotton tree, have been linked to folklore and superstition, whilst others are used for medicinal as well as religious purposes. For example, this agave is called a sentry plant, meaning it can be used in over 100 different ways. In fact, we were told by the supervisor of this park that it's used to make the tequila drink. Now, it's fair to say that tequila and pop culture go hand in hand. And in the Trinidad and Tobago context, this phrase is right up there with those two. It became popular when Anya Ayang Chi named her winning collection for Project Runway, Tobago Love. Soka star Sherwin Winchester seized on it and marketed this island's first carnival all-inclusive fete as just that. Now that expression is the theme for this year's Tobago Fashion Coda, but Tobago love would also be showcased through art at the event. They say your heart should be open to receive love, and this hanging heart-shaped piece, which lights up at night and weighs about 40 kilos, does just that. But this piece of jewelry is not just about any love. It holds a special place for Tobago. The piece has crystals which resemble the reflection of the beach, fishes, turtles, and the boats. Steel, metal, aluminum, crystal, uh, vintage pieces of chandeliers from Europe, glass and yeah, basically metal, glass and, and crystal. I think the patrons are out for a surprise. The designer also envisions the piece being utilized right on the island in a unique way. Tobago doesn't have any sculptures in the streets so we were thinking of that is our first example of what we could do, and we could go further. There are so many roundabouts in so many places which are empty in Tobago, and it would be nice to have some pieces of art there. The producer of Tobago Fashion Coda, Don Grant, says the initiative to have the art piece at his show brings another aspect of entertainment to Tobago. In taking that, that, that other aspect of the tourism trade, and the chosen thrust that Tobago Fashion Coda is, I found this art to be like a natural gravitation to other extensions that this perhaps could fall into as well, you see? As we choose to diversify the economy from oil and gas in Trinidad and Tobago, and in 
Tobago in particular, I find that uh, fashion is certainly one of the vehicles we, 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 we need to explore in a big bit, in a bigger and better way. The art piece will be auctioned and a part of the proceeds will be given to a local charity. I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago. Did you know that Buku Goat Racing started in 1925 with Samuel Callender? The event started off as the poor man's equivalent to horse racing, but over the years it has grown, even achieving national and to some extent international acclaim. It's a must do if you come to Tobago around Easter with races at Mount Pleasant on Monday and Buku on Tuesday. And to ensure its longevity, a new stadium was built for the races in 2010. It was the architect's way of ensuring patrons enjoy the races in comfort. But before the big day, here's a look at some of the work that goes into making it a success. The village is quiet. Persons are going about their daily activities such as fishing, taking a dip in the sea, or taking tourists to Buku Reef. But come Easter Tuesday, thousands will converge on this small fishing community to take part in the Buku goat races at the Buku Integrated Facility, where on the tower side, there's a track specially designed for this event. For the track for the goat racing, special means that a couple of days before, it, the field needs to be brush cut, it needs to be raked, it needs to be some, a word we call it in, in landscaping, manicured. So we prepare the field in that way so that the runners, when they're running, the grass would not choke their feet, um, disturb them and whatnot. And in order for these patrons to enjoy the activities, there's a maintenance crew which ensures that the facilities are kept clean and up to standard at all times. Safety is also a concern for the management of the facilities because of the massive crowds that will be hosted here. And the manager, Stephen Rewan, working with the fire service and the Buku Village Council, are ensuring that safety measures are in place to protect persons as they enjoy the goat races. We started to institute some health and safety measures with parking, with egress in, with egress out, the use of the, the, use of the toilet facilities, safety moments, and things like that. The Buku Village Council is the institution responsible for organizing and marketing the event for the past 89 years. And as the event gets bigger every year, the council is moving towards more electronic systems so that visitors can have a lasting experience. Like last year, we implemented a, a certain system, computerized system, basically for the ticketing, online ticketing as well, and also gate for entrance at the gate, at the various entrance points for the gate, you understand? So then at that point in time, we could determine exactly how much people or when it peaked on the grounds at that point, at, at any point in time. The village council collaborates with the Goat Owners Association so that the goats are registered and ready for the various races come Easter Tuesday. They also work with the THA for sponsorship of prizes for the winners. I'm Omodara Mills for Let's Talk Tobago. If you're into the arts and you like dance, then this next story should be of interest to you. The group you're about to meet gave Tobago its first contemporary dance festival two years ago. Many said the production by the Urban Ritual Dance Company was unparalleled and unforgettable, living up to its director's dream. The festival has grown since, attracting dance companies from the Sister Isle and the Caribbean region. Here are some highlights from the event. Contemporary dance is a style of expression that combines elements of several dance genres, including modern, jazz, lyrical and classical ballet. Contemporary dancers strive to connect the mind and the body through fluid dance movements. At the third annual Tobago Contemporary Dance Festival, this was quite evident. It's said that the dance stresses versatility and the dancers focus on floor work using gravity to pull them to the floor. And the festival incorporated all of this.
Youth dancers were also involved, displaying their knowledge of contemporary dancing using modern music. The Tobago Contemporary Dance Festival took place at the Blackwalk Heritage Park and this year saw two nights of dancing with international acts as well. It is a clear indication that this event is growing and will definitely take its rightful place on the Tobago calendar of events. The festival was partly sponsored by the Tobago House of Assembly. There's a I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago. And it's time to have your say, the segment of our program where we hear from you, our viewers. As we speak, the Tobago Jazz Experience is in full swing. The nine-day event started on Saturday, April 19th and is expected to be the biggest of them all. More than 40,000 people are expected in Tobago. Flights and ferry tickets are sold out and the Division of Tourism and Transportation also had to print an additional 2,500 tickets. The coordinator estimates that the main event will attract a crowd in excess of 8,000 people. All the elements for a great festival. So today we're asking, what is your expectation of the Tobago Jazz Experience? This is what you said. Well, I'm looking, thinking about the economics. And hopefully, like the previous jazz festival, this will bring a lot of tourists. You know, it's bringing people from all over the world to see what Tobago has to offer. Pa apart from the Jazz Festival, you know, they will, you know, explore the island a bit and know more about Tobago. So, I expect a lot from Jazz. Well, my expectation of jazz, jazz Festival is a little more local. Into the festival, mixed with the foreign. The Tobago Jazz Festival. Well, I hope it uh, is very successful for everybody concerned. It sounds as though it's well organized and should be okay. I work together with um, the, one of their great singers last year. I was her driver. You know, um, and I'm hoping to get that contract again. Yeah, well, the expectation of Jazz Festival, plenty of tourists. I have people from England, Canada, America, from the Caribbean and all coming for the Jazz Festival, so you know. The Jazz Festival is a good event because it is bringing a lot of tourists in the country, you know I mean, which is good for the growth development process now. And that's how we bring this week's edition of Let's Talk Tobago to a close. Remember, you can send us your comments or queries on anything you've seen in this program to information at tha.gov.tt or visit us at www.tha.gov.tt. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Colleen Holder, and on behalf of all of us at the Department of Information, have a safe and enjoyable week. And as we go, we leave you now with a final look at the Scarborough Botanical Gardens.